What is up, everyone? Welcome into a new episode of the Fight HQ Podcast. Of course, I am Jason Floyd. As always, I am joined by the fighter Pete Rogers Jr. Pete, uh, it's a Monday, so we're here very early. UFC 300. Uh, of course, uh, maybe, it probably is, the most stacked UFC card in history. But I was talking to a buddy about this uh, the other night, and I said, you know what? It's a super stacked card, but it's like we're still kind of missing like that that superstar fighter on the card. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm excited about this this fight card for sure from top to bottom. This is the type of product that I can get behind. You know what I mean? Like, this mm-hmm. is the type of product that does not make me bang my head against my desk trying to pick a side <laughs> or trying to be perfect on a DFS slate. And, you know, like, there's going to be some volatile fights and some – it all comes down to who's better that night. But, like, I, I'm fine and I can live with being wrong on a card this talented. But, like mm-hmm. – other cards in the past, man. I don't know. I don't know if the UFC is just like the, their quality of product has gotten to me a little bit. And it's just like, dude, I'm breaking down fights that on the regional scene are probably not even main events. And and, and like it's very difficult to try to really pick a side. Um, and probably the solution to that is just embrace the volatility. But it's kind of tough unless you're maxing out a ton of contests, which I'm not doing anymore. So it's like um, – Playing that single entry, trying to single bullet it mm-hmm. is is really, really difficult. But that's that I would like that to happen, you know, and I feel like it's totally possible on a card like this. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, we look at these UFC Apex cards. I get what the UFC is doing. They're in the content uh, the content distribution business. They're trying to give yeah. ESPN all the content they want. But, yeah, there's times where you look at somebody's fights on the car, you're just – and I use the analogy of sitting there and going, hey, do you want to sit at home on a, a Saturday night and watch these fights or – Go do something with your, your spouse, your buddies, whatever it may be. And, and that's where you, you kind of look at some of these cards. Of course, we come off a week uh, where Brandon Allen gets the win against Chris Kirsch. Congratulations uh, to DX371 for taking down the Fight HQ contest, uh, scoring 485 points. Actually, had three losing fighters in his lineup. Uh, of course, one of that being Chris Curtis, who got 65 points. And I know there's definitely some people out there that th- thought Chris Curtis maybe should have gotten the victory there. In that one, uh, but also uh, Nelly Baamondas, who scored almost 117 points, Charlie Campbell with 96 points, and, and, and Cornell with 105 points. So we'll have a contest up here later on this week for UFC 300. But Pete, let's kind of talk a little about game theory here. And as I was, you know, putting together a spreadsheet this morning with, with the salaries and some of the betting lines out there, I mean, one of the, I think where I kind of start is I look at there are t- these two light heavyweight matchups, obviously the main event, and also the feature prelim matchup with Yuri Pahachka and Alexander Rakic, where you have two fighters, in one in each fight, that is coming off a fairly serious you know, leg injury, where you have Jamal Hill coming off the Achilles tent injury, which I, I've seen football players go through that. That's a, I mean, and they were going to have this matchup a month from now, so I'm interested to see what does he look like. And, of course, Rakic coming off the ACL injury. So, like, it's one of those things of, the salary wise, you like where the salary points are on all four of those fighters, but I do have concerns about the two fighters coming back from injury. Yeah, I mean, totally, totally understandable, right? Like uh, Jamal Hill looked amazing, you know, um, ended up injuring his Achilles, which is a massive, massive injury in itself for all sports. Uh, really, really common for basketball. And and if I remember correctly, that's actually how he heard it, it, it like playing a pickup game mm-hmm. yep. from what I heard. Um, but you know, coming back into mixed martial arts, that's something that I would imagine is difficult. The, the, the good thing here is that he's not really going up against a wrestler. Okay. He's going up against a kickboxer. So the one worry you have to worry about is clearly the calf kicks, um, and the leg kicks in general, uh, going up against Alex Pereira. But I think that it would be much more of a difference maker if he was going up against somebody who's going to you know, wrestle and wrestle often. Um, because I, I would imagine that would probably be the most difficult part about getting his feet back under him, uh, from the Achilles injury. Uh, and then you, you mentioned, we have the massive ACL injury from Alexander Rakic, who I picked to become the, uh, the light heavyweight champion of the world. And, uh, that that's the guy that I thought was going to be the light heavyweight champ. I still hold him in high regard. That's a massive injury to come back from. Um, but it's, it's kind of been uh, like become pretty common that, you know, as terrible as it is, we've seen more dominant cruise situations, uh, in the past several or five years or so than we, than we used to. 
It, it used to be like the end, the, the exit door. You get a big ACL injury and there's the exit and uh, your, your career is going to fall off a cliff. And we've, we've seen fighters come back from it. Um, I, I do think that it's, an, it's a compelling matchup going up against Yuri Prohoshka. Um, but I, I do think that Rakic, you know, unlike some other fighters, probably took the proper time to heal, get back to training, um, and, and, and not rush the recovery. So, uh, massive injuries, really compelling matchups. Can't wait to see how it goes and can't wait to see where, where your, your mind's at with some of these matchups. You know, I, I think some of the other things when I think about game theory is I look at a matchup on the preliminary card where we have a fire moving up to 145 pounds, that being Aljamain Sterling taking on Calvin Cater. I think that's interesting. You know, and then I look at some of these options that are 7,500 and below, and I think we're, we're probably going to see some high ownership on some of these fighters. You got Max Holloway at 7,400, Charles Oliveira. He's at 7,500. Uh, Holly Holm at 6,900. Uh, and Hinato Bancano at 7,300. And pro- you can probably throw Cody Garbrandt in there at 7,100. I think that, you know, we, when we're looking at trying to, you know, hand build lineups and, you know, somebody, there are some interesting underdogs this week. And, and like, why do I just feel like is maybe Jalen Turner versus Sonato Mancano the key to taking down a GPP this week? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like that matchup. I love Jalen Turner. I think he's massive for the division. I think he's so damn dangerous and uh, underrated as far as his grappling, too. Um, a very, very sneaky front head choke series. Uh, from the front headlock position, um, you know, can wrap up a guillotine if he hurts you on the feet, can butcher you on the feet. Um, but, you know, that cardio is going to get tested. And we did see that Dan Hooker was able to uh, to last and pick up a dub o- over Jalen Turner. So I'm, I'm interested to see if Hanato Moicano can survive on the feet because mm-hmm. if he can survive on the feet and implement his takedowns, his back takes and his rear naked choke abilities are probably up there in the elite tier. I really have to say he's a phenomenal back taker. Um, not the best striker. I think that he's a competent striker, but I don't trust his durability. Most of his damage and most of his knockouts, if not all of them have come at a weight class lower than where he's fighting at now. Uh, previously at 145 pounds, but being knocked out by numerous people, Jose Aldo, Chan Sung Jung, um, you know, getting hurt and then guillotine against Brian Ortega. So I, I do think that 155, he he's probably not feeling the effects of the weight cut as much. And he's super, super talented and a part of a strong camp. Um, so I, I do think that Hanato Moicano can be one of the underdogs to come through for people this week. I happen to be on the Jalen Turner side. I, I just think that he's a nightmare of a matchup for most people within the division. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, and also I think you have to note our top three fights are all scheduled for five rounds, so you got to think about that. I, I think we'll probably talk a lot about that when we get to Justin Gaethje and, and Max Holloway because <laughs> I, I still say the cra- one of the craziest stats in the UFC is the fact that Max Holloway, who's got, what, 20-plus UFC fights, has never been knocked down. Yeah, it's crazy, man. And, and people are discounting and counting out my boy Max Holloway. I might be on an island this week, but... Uh, I really, really like Max Holloway just from a, a five round um, aspect. And, you know, I got I got some things to bring up in the Gaethje type of uh, matchup because not too long ago we were picking Tony Ferguson to dismantle Justin Gaethje over over five <laughs> rounds back when COVID popped off. House and holy Marie. shit, were we wrong. <laughs> yeah, holy shit. I mean, Tony Ferguson got absolutely destroyed. That's one of the worst. I, I think that's like one of the few times I watched fights and I was like cringing because of the sound, the effects, every shot that landed, like you saw Tony was out on his feet numerous times and I couldn't have been more wrong in that situation. And uh, Holy moly. That was kind of like Justin Gaethje just catapulting to another, another level within his career. It's a prime example of, we never know when we're going to start seeing the downside of a fire's career. And and you look at Tony Ferguson and that really was a star of the downside of his career. And of course, everything that's happened since then. I mean, you know, I can remember when, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were like, man, is Tony Ferguson or Javier Nurmagomedov the greatest lightweight in in the UFC? And of course, we never got to see that fight because of so many different circumstances. And and it just, things can, and I always say this, man, father time is undefeated. At, at, At some point, father time, it gets everyone. And, and all yeah. of a sudden, you can't perform. And, and, man, we've seen it in mixed martial arts countless times. I mean, you know, it, it's just – it happens. 
Yeah, it happens. So Father Time's undefeated, but there's also something about damage. We got to come up with some type of memorable quote about damage because that really ages people significantly. Mm -hmm. And my God, um, you know, and it comes down to like in the Gaethje and Holloway, like they both have taken a ton of damage throughout their career, been a part of wars. Who's whose chin's going to hold up? I mean, like I'd probably still say Max Holloway. I mean, he he hasn't given me a reason not to to think that whereas Gaethje in the past has been, you know, outworked or hurt at times, but very, very interesting fight. And, you know, as far as like a, a DFS strategy outside of betting, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to get away from all three, you know, five round bouts. I, I'm going to try to do my damnedest to have, you know, all three of them in a lineup. You know, I, I just think that's, y you have to, you're, you're accounting for 25 minutes even the underdogs, they can set you up for uh, for some success. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I might like actually take more of a cash game approach, like just for a little bit, start to uh, to hone in on the cash type of mindset. And uh, sometimes cash lineups take down GPPs too. So I, I will dabble with those cash lineups into into GPPs as well. Yeah, especially when we're talking about three five round fights, and if yeah. if if these goes twenty five minutes, and and more particularly looking at the co main event and, and the Gagey Holloway matchup, is if they go out there and, and have twenty five minutes, good chance they could be end up being optimal based on what happens in it. But Pete, let's get right into breaking this one down. Of course, we appreciate everyone tuning in for this episode of Fight HQ. Uh, if you can be sure to smash that thumbs up button right here on YouTube, I would very much appreciate it. Leave a comment. Of course, so if you're not subscribed to the channel, be sure to subscribe to the channel. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of this week. Of course. So we got the main event, uh, Alex Bahia defending the light heavyweight title against the former champion, Jamal Hill. Of course, Jamal Hill had to vacate the title due to that Achilles injury. He is a slight betting underdog here at plus 110, minus 130 for Alex Bahia. Uh, Bahia, 8,300 on DK. Jamal Hill, 7,900 DK. The only thing that has concerned me leading up this matchup is Jamal Hill has kind of done some interviews where he threw it out there of like, why does everyone think I'm just going to try to take this one to the ground? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a big Jamal Hill guy, um, and this was, this is kind of crazy because I wasn't all that impressed with him coming into the UFC. Like I remember when he fought Darko Stozic, if I remember correctly, and you know I might have picked Darko Stozic to to beat him because I thought he's going to take him down, and he took him down six times. But Jamal Hill on the feet is a problem. He's a problem. I don't care about these kickboxing and accolades. I don't care about any of that. He just he he just outworks people on the feet. He has crazy volume. He is a southpaw, so his reach, his angles are just different. Um, I think that he causes problems for a lot of people, and when he touches people, he hurts them, man. You know, he he's knocked down Clitson Abreu twice, uh, knocked down Jimmy Crute, knocked down Johnny Walker, uh, put out crazy tremendous volume two thirty two to seventy five over Glover Teixeira. Uh, if you want to take him down, he'll still work his way back to the feet. He can get takedowns in this fight and make this fight so damn easy against Alex Pereira. Um, clearly, the red flag is just the uh, is coming back from that injury. And what happens if he hurts it? You know, by getting calf kicked. Because if I'm Alex Pereira, I'm telling you right now, I'm I'm touching him on the feet and blasting away at his leg immediately. Uh, outside of that, like. Maybe his training is not up to par. Maybe his training is not like that of an elite level camp. And this is kind of a quick turnaround from an Achilles injury, you know, from my experience. Uh, granted, it all comes down to how he feels. But I feel like in other sports, like Jason could talk about the NFL, if somebody had an Achilles injury, I don't think that we'd be seeing them this quickly. Um, but I will say, with all that being said, I'm picking Jamal Hill. I'm picking Jamal Hill to uh, to reclaim that belt. I really am. I, I think that he's going to knock out Alex Pereira. Um, clearly, Pereira can win and you know land that devastating left hook and has the more one shot power. But I'm really not like able to trust the chin of Pereira from from things I've seen from his wars and his from his kickboxing to MMA. I just think uh, the better small glove fighter is Jamal Hill. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that like fantastic kickboxers crossover. We just saw that last week with the guy who fought, uh, you know, Alex Pereira on the kickboxing scene and, and came through as an underdog. They, they do well, but like, I remember Gokan Saki came over and, and 
he fought Khalil Roundtree, and Roundtree just blew the doors off and just lit him up because small glove fighting is completely different. It really is. So uh, with all that being said, it's just a feeling that I have. Pereira's probably the safer pick. I'm at 8,300. I love Jamal here at 7,900. I love the volume. You look at the frames, 79-inch reach for both of them, 7.31 significant strikes uh, you know, per minute versus Pereira's five. Uh, I just think that there's way more ways for Jamal Hill to win this fight than Alex Pereira, and I'll be siding with Jamal Hill to reclaim the throne. I'm glad you mentioned about those strikes land per minute from each guy because as you were talking, the, the thing that came to my mind was – Who's got the better striking defense? Mm. Yeah, it's it's tough because I will say that like if you look at the striking defense metrics, like they're pretty close. Fifty percent for Pereira, forty seven percent for Jamal Hill. The opposite stance, though, I think is going to um, make things a little bit more interesting, and that's where like Jamal Hill switches between. And if he goes orthodox, I don't remember which leg he hurt, but let's say it was his left leg. If he goes orthodox, he has to be careful of that calf kick. Um, But just the ability to switch, that straight left hand down the pipe can't miss. I I just think that him going southpaw in a way does kind of negate the the nasty left hook of Pereira. It's still there, of course, but whenever you have two opposing sides, orthodox versus southpaw, it's the backhand and the back leg that makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense, and that that should be the prime weapon for most people. So it would be the straight left hand and the left kick for uh, Jamal Hill, and the straight right hand and the right kick for Alex Pereira. But you know, I, I've seen Jamal switch stances and kind of shift from position to position. I'm just gonna go with Jamal Hill here. I'm not going to really hold that injury over his head. He put out like a little funny video of like what everybody thinks is going to happen. And he, he got kicked in the calf a couple of times and he had like deer, you know, uh, he looked like a deer in headlights with his eyes. And then he ran away and climbed out of the cage. So he, he knows what the, the most likely game plan is. Um, and he's kind of embracing it with some humor. So I'm going to be going Jamal Hill, but I totally understand if people want to go with Alex Pereira there at 8,300. And as uh, Rogue mentions in the chat, he says, I don't see uh, Jamal Hill taking him down. He has a good takedown defense, but I don't recall any offensive wrestling. One of the things I I have thought about about this matchup leading into it is, you know, A, who's going to lead the dance? If we're saying that, hey, we we feel like most likely this is going to play out on the feed is who can be the person leading the dance? And, and like, I feel like for Jamal Hill, the key to me is getting Alex Bahia's feet behind that black line. So where he's basically Mm -hmm. essentially a step or two away from having his back up against the fence. That's where that that's just the scenario I just keep seeing is if I'm Jamal Hill, I think that's got to be the path of victory. Yeah, I I mean, I think so, too. It's just like. I do think that if they if they were to grapple right now, Jamal Hill smokes him, like just smokes him. I, I I've seen him get out of bad positions. Um, I know that Pereira trains with Glover Teixeira, so maybe this is a little bit of an X factor, and that you know Pereira wants to get this back for his team and for Glover, for his uh, for his idol and his teammate, his coach. Um, but I I still do think that like from what I've seen from the chin of Pereira. I think it might look like Johnny Walker against Jamal Hill. I think that he might knock him out bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's. I think it's going to be very tough to get away from this fight in GPPs. But if you're looking to get, a, you know, if you're you're trying to get in that 150 max and you're not a max player, maybe you're just throwing a, an entry here, entry there. You know, maybe getting away from this matchup could kind of help you get away from some of that ownership. So we'll see what happens there. Of course, our co-main event is also a title fight as Zhang Wali that makes her uh, next title defense taking on Yan Jinan. Yan Jinan is a plus 360 betting underdog. Wei Li, minus 525. Wei Li on DK, she's 9,200. And for Jinan, it is 7,000, Pete. Hey, real quick. Did you know that I got third place in our listener league last week? Um, so I just, ha- I have to do a little victory lap with that. I, I, mean, I did, I, I did had- not notice. No, I did not notice. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, Jason. I, t- I had two losing fighters too. So, um, but yeah, it was a weird week last week. Now, what I learned from last week is that you have to be very, I mean, we've known about this. You got to be very careful back in women's MMA favorites. Like you really do. I mean, like Melissa Dixon last week, um, Mullins, whatever her name is. Uh, she, she, I mean, that's low level, right? Like that's not championship level. 
Um, and, and perhaps you shouldn't compare the two, but I will say that like massive favorites in women's MMA seem to be pretty volatile. I mean, look at Blanchfield against Manon Fioro. Um, you just had Melissa Mullins, uh, you know, get knocked out with a body shot just because she chose to strike with a kickboxer and not go out there and implement grappling from the get go. You have to set up your takedowns. I understand that, but like there needs to be an emphasis on closing the gap. Um, the issue was the tie plum. Like when, when she was initiating the, the, the clinch, you know, her opponent just framed and, and kept kneeing her in her body and she was pretty soft in the midsection. So it worked out. Now, Zhang Wei Li is probably one of the most pound for pound, like one of the best pound for pound fighters out there. I don't care male, female, none of that. I think that Zhang Wei Li is so damn skilled here. So skilled and so well-rounded that I do think she's the more well-rounded of the two in this matchup against Yan Xiaonan. I, I think that if she wrestles, she can make this look pretty pretty decisive that, that she's going to win some rounds. Now, I will say that Yan Xiaonan is a fighter that I was not necessarily high on coming into the UFC, but she rattled off a ton of different victories because if you keep it on the feet with her, she'll out-volume you. She can defend some initial takedowns. Uh, that she has shown in the past to, to have a susceptibility of getting held down on the ground. One of Carla Esparza's very few finishes within her career, um, but she was down there getting elbowed in, in crucifix position. So there was some greenness to her game, but really diving into the team alpha male team and committing herself. I actually think that we've seen like a lot of development for Yan Xiaonan. Now, if you're giving, if you're telling me who's who should I pick, I'm gonna pick Zhang Wei Li to just be the more complete fighter over five rounds. Definitely tested in five round atmosphere, has the better ground game of the two, comparable if not better striking than Yan Shaonan. I just do think that it's a little interesting of a matchup, and the reason being is you know, um, big big fight for their country. Yan Shaonan, does she deserve this this matchup? I don't know. She's 17 and three, a couple fights removed from losing a decision to, to uh, Marina Rodriguez. And then that TKO to Carla Esparza showed some good awareness in some st stages against uh, Mackenzie Dern, but really knocking out Jessica Andrade was like a massive, massive, um, you know, win for her. And, and it was just, it, it really got her into this title contention. I do think that there's like, a pretty big gap from the salaries if this goes 25 minutes. And let's say Zhang Wei Li can't get the fight to the ground as much as she wants. And if anything, what last week and previous weeks has shown me is to have be a little skeptical, be a little skeptical about your uh, your faith in large women's MMA favorites, unless you truly think they have just like an absolute advantage over their opponent. I think she has an advantage over Yan Shaonan. On the feet, is it a significant advantage? No, it's not. So I actually think she, I think Yan Shaonan might surprise some people and uh, win some rounds here. So I really think she could win one or two rounds, but I st it's still really hard for me to come to grips with her winning three or more over Zhang Wei Li. So um, the pick will be Zhang Wei Li. The exposure will be smashing Yan Shaonan and probably just like take all logic out of the equation, play more Yan Shaonan than you're comfortable with. You know, going back there on biggest upsets in UFC history, by the way, our three big favorites this week, two of the three are in female matchups. And if you look at the top five upsets in UFC history, number one, uh, Dobson plus 950 against Agapova. Number two, Home plus 830 versus Rousey. Uh, three, Matt Sarah when he was uh, plus uh, eight and a half to one underdog against GSP. Uh, four, Juliana Pena at plus 700. Uh, and then you had uh, um, Jackson at plus 700 against Barry, who is number five. So, I mean, and of course, we'll talk about uh, Kayla Harrison a little bit later. She's a five to one betting favorite. And of course, yeah. Bo Nickel is a, a massive betting favorite. We'll mention a comment here from Alex. Wei Li is a lock. Nope. Women's MMA. And I know that sounds really stupid, but like, Skill wise, she shouldn't make this competitive at all. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Aaron Blanchfield, skill wise, had a massive advantage over Manon Fioro and like was shooting naked takedowns, not setting anything up. 
uh, chose to continue to strike with her. The range, the footwork, the speed, and the striking difference really made a difference in that matchup. And the better fighter didn't win that night. And that's all I'm saying is maybe Zhang Wei Li with a fellow countryman, countrywoman, maybe she's not going to be as tenacious as, as she would be with somebody else. And this could be a nice spot. Regardless, it's a win-win for the country. But I, I'm going to like really smash smash exposure to Yan Xiaonan just because even as a punt, the likelihood is that this goes long and she's shown exceptional skill on the feet, good volume, and like for cash, that's probably what I'm going to do is it, just mm-hmm. go right to Yan Xiaonan and it makes all the sense in the world. So, I mean, from a, a construction standpoint, I'm back-to-back underdogs, but from a pick uh, it is still Zhang Weili. Yeah, if you want to go prop game hunt on Weili, TKO KO plus 140, plus 550 to win me a submission. And for decision, plus 175. I mean, look, if you wanted to throw a sprinkle out there on Yan Janan, uh, and you want to get a little bit better than the plus 360 betting odds out there, you can go there and get her by decision at plus 450. Not something I would recommend because I do think Weili's going to go out there and get the job done. But um, it, look, when we talk about Bo Nickel and Cody Brunage on the betting side, uh, we're, we're prop game hunting in that fight. Yeah. We, we are not not even looking at that straight up money line uh let's get over to uh the next uh matchup of course uh this will be justin gaethje taking on max holloway the bff bmf title is online so can't believe that's actually a thing in the ufc but well it's still a thing and justin gaethje a minus 175 betting favorite max holloway plus 145 uh gaethje's 800 dk holloway 7400 dk Pete, my big concern here with Max Holloway is more about it being at 55 and, and how he has looked fighting at 55 in comparison to what we've seen throughout his career at 145 pounds. I think it's a great spot. And the reason I think it's a great spot is because if we didn't have that Dustin Poirier fight hanging over our head about Max versus uh, Dustin previously dabbling in the 155-pound division, I feel like the odds and the salaries would be much closer. Um, I, I do think that there would be much more respect for Max Holloway in a situation like that. You're talking about one of the best pound for pound fighters ever. Max Holloway, former champ, absolutely incredible, throws with significant volume. The question marks surrounding him were always about like, will he be able to, will that chin finally crack? And uh, dude, like I haven't seen anything besides, you know, Max just going out there and outworking people definitely has the, the higher fight IQ. In, in a situation here against Justin Gaethje. Um, probably less wear and tear because Gaethje's been willing to go out there. He's been dropped numerous times. He's been in crazy wars. Uh, the the Poirier fight, the Eddie Alvarez fight, the damn Michael Johnson, like everything's been a war. Um, I, I I don't know, man. I, I Everybody's so convinced. Like all the all my guys at work, all the older guys that watch uh, UFC, they, they love picking my brain with fights. I'm at work and they just love picking my brain and, and they have like their, um, their knee jerk reactions to fights and then what they initially think. And then they, they kind of just come up to me and ask me and I shut a lot of them down and they get pissed. And then it turns out I, I'm, you know, more likely than not, I'm right on a lot of them. And so it just makes for a great conversation. I will say that I think Max is finally a 55er. I think he's finally a 55er if he wants to be. And it reminds me of myself of just like maturity, um, you know, just what your body's going to feel like now versus how it used to feel. Uh, He throws with significant volume, 7.17 significant strikes per minute versus Gaethje, 7.35 significant strikes per minute. Uh, the, the strikes absorbed is what really, really makes me want to lean towards max here. And it's uh, strikes absorbed per Gaethje is 7.5 per minute and max Holloway 4.75. I think everybody's expecting max to just stand in the phone booth with them. And I don't think that's, what's going to happen at all. Because if you stand in the phone booth with Gaethje, then you probably will wake up looking at the lights. It could very well be max's first time getting knocked out in there. Um, I, you know, we, we know about Gaethje's wrestling. I don't think that he has the best submission defense. Uh, I think in a scramble, Max could actually be pretty sneaky with submission skills. Uh, We've never really seen Max go to the takedown well because he doesn't need to, but I think that he can. He went to the well in the Yair Rodriguez fight, had three takedowns in that bout. I'm just saying in a crazy fight with a crazy pace, 
I trust the pace and the endurance of Max Holloway a little bit more. Um, I, I think that Gaethje's pace, he's fine when he's the one leading the dance, but if he is the, uh, if he's getting touched up by a matador, which is what I'm expecting Max Holloway to be on Saturday, I think that there could be some frustration there and some, you know, over expenditure of energy. So I'm, I'm going against the public, man. I'm going here with Max Holloway. I think that he's a fantastic DFS play from a betting perspective. I think that you're getting him with significant uh, value attached to him as well. I'm willing to be wrong on one of the best pound for pound fighters ever. So, Give me Max Holloway here at 7,400. And from a construction standpoint, that's three underdogs back to back to back. Jamal Hill, Yan Shaonan, and Max Holloway for some of my lineups. You know, one of the things, and you really didn't touch on it, is to me is how does Max Holloway deal with the leg kicks of Justin Gaethje? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that he switches stances well. I, he's, you know, he can switch stances. I think outside of the leg kicks, like, Gaethje landed a head kick and knocked out Dustin Poirier. Yes. Who has the better kicking arsenal, though, as far as, like, variety and dexterity? It's Max Holloway. I think Max Holloway could spin and back kick Justin Gaethje in the face if he wants. Um, you know, we've seen him throw glancing head kicks against Alex Volkanovsky. So, like, I view Max as, like, the more – he has the more variety to his strikes, whereas Justin Gaethje kind of has that Dutch style about him. Big, big, heavy hands into heavy chopping low kicks. So he could brutalize Max's legs, where he has been heavy on the uh, in the past. I'm just, I'm willing to uh, to to side with the underdog here with Max Holloway. With it being Monday, there's not a ton of props out there, but I just went over to see the props on, on this one, particularly looking at the round props. And I think this maybe tells you kind of where the books are kind of thinking at this point. We'll see how the betting public goes from here. Uh, fight goes the distance is over DraftKings Sportsbook, minus 110. Fight doesn't go the distance, minus 120. Um, even if you, know, you wanted to take it over four and a half rounds, that's only at minus 120. I mean, there's not really plus money out there. Um, and, and Alex in the chat says, if Justin loses, he will retire. Mm-hmm. I... I Gagey to me, I think he's going to go until the wheels fall off, you know, and and he's making a ton. And, and when there's a lot of money involved, it's it's very tough to walk away uh, from the sport. I mean, there, there's so. I mean, we're talking about a 58 year old Mike Tyson fighting later this year. Yeah, don't get me started with that shit. And you know, I'm a little fired up, so <laughs> yeah, I may start. I may start cussing a little bit more on this channel. Um, but yeah, I but. do find it. I will say this. I find it very interesting. Is yeah, I could see one of these guys and, and, and Samuel in the chat saying he goes, uh, he's expecting someone to falter late. And it is interesting when you look at these prop bets here, you could get a Max Holloway at plus 900 to win by TKO KO. Like that, like you talk about wanting to throw a, a betting sprinkle out there. I don't mind giving you that. Even if you wanted to go either one of these guys via decision, Justin's at plus 240, Max is at plus 275. Of course, I, I highly unlikely we see a submission in, in this one. I don't expect yeah. that one to happen. But, uh, I mean, the Gaethje TKO prop is at plus 130. Yeah, man. I, I mean, like, Gaethje's a dog. Uh, Gaethje's an absolute dog. I do, I do think that his, you know, under the tutelage of Trevor Whitman over the years, he's capitalized on his skills and his raw power 100%. I do still think that defensively there are some issues that, I don't know, man. It's like maybe he just gets away with it in the gym. When people stand in front of him, they're, they're going to to look for a way out. I just don't think Max is going to stand right in front of him. Like Arnold Allen hits really damn hard too, and not as hard as Justin Gaethje clearly. But like I thought Max looked fantastic in there. And Arnold Allen is one of the – he's a very, very cerebral fighter out there. And, you know, Max has some momentum. It's not like he's jumping up a weight class grasping for straws for success. This, this is Max Holloway who is – you know, he, he's picking up some wins. He he just had a knockout over Chan Sung Jung and a decision win over Arnold Allen and, you know, decision lost to Volk, but Yari Rodriguez and Calvin Cater. Mm-hmm. Styles make fights, man. And and I know that, you know, Volkanovsky pitter-pattered his way to some decision victories over him. I think the aggressiveness of Gaethje could actually be the detriment. But I've been saying that for how many tough, how many fights? <clears throat> Right, like I said that in how many fights at Gaethje's, and he's proved me wrong. Uh, I I picked him in the Poirier rematch, and I'm picking against him here. I'm going Max Holloway. 
at some point the wheels are going to fall off. I mean, yeah. and you mentioned it earlier on the show, you know, the damage. And, and to me, it's not just the damage that you take in the fight. It's that damage leading up to the matchup. I mean, you know, and I think of someone like a Kamaru Usman who has, you know, been in combat sports, wrestling, MMA for his entire life. And you've heard him talk about the, the, the wear and tear on his body just from all these years of competition. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, next up, we got a huge matchup in the lightweight division. Who knows? Maybe they get the next title shot, or maybe they're going to have to wait till after Dustin Boyer. But we've got Charles Oliveira and Armin Saruki. And Saruki, a minus 235 betting favorite. The Bronx is at plus 190. Uh, Oliveira, 7,500 DK. Saruki, 8,700. And Pete, I kind of feel like when we're talking about those under. 7,600 and under fighters that a lot of people are going to kind of circle Charles Oliveira as kind of a salary saver this week. Don't blame him at all. I don't blame him at all. I mean, Charles Oliveira, former champ, one of the best reigns in the UFC. Like, my God, Charles Oliveira is such a stud. And, you know, like, they, Annex says this about some people, your favorite fighter, favorite fighter. I really think that Oliveira might, like, be one of the most popular favorite fighters out there. Like, everybody loves Charles Oliveira. Because he went from a kid in the UFC who had all this, all the skills in the world, all the potential in the world, but he had some quit in him. And I don't know what the hell he did. If he just, you know, with Diego Lima shoot the box, they just beat the hell out of him in training to kind of get rid of that quit. But he stepped up to the plate, man. And he, he became a force to be reckoned with within the UFC. I mean, you know, you used to see him kind of flake out of fights in the past and, you know, like it just it's so crazy to me that like he went on this run i mean like max holloway tko'd him you know we we saw paul felder even tko him, but there was a stretch where he had wins over guida yagos miller tamer lentz gordon kevin lee tony ferguson chandler dustin poirier and justin gaethje holy moly but islam mahachev is a uh is a nightmare of a matchup for him because of the wrestling and because of the top control you saw that when Islam Mahachev took him down, well, he, he knocked him down and then took him down twice. He subbed him with an arm triangle in the second round. Uh, if you are a very dominant wrestler and, and are wise to the jiu-jitsu skill set of Charles Oliveira, you could do really well in a matchup like this. You have to, A, be able to absorb some strikes on the feet without getting knocked out, ask Benil Dariush. Um, and then you also have to have that wrestling in your back pocket to you know put him on his back, and make him just a jiu-jitsu fighter where he's comfortable off his back, but you're still defensively aware of what's happening. Because he'll go for leg locks, he'll chain everything together. I remember he had, you know, like the first calf slicer I ever saw in, in MMA. And I was just like, oh my God, that was so nasty. Um, so Charles Oliveira is probably the most popular underdog on the entire slate. People love him. And because of his popularity, they're going to smash that 7,500 and they're going to get to him. The issue here, though, is that I think Armin Sarukian, part of American top team, and with that incredible wrestling in his back pocket, I think that he can be wise to the attacks of, you know, Charles Oliveira. Um, you know, we did see the one time that his wrestling was tested was against uh, Mataj Gamrat, um, and he ended up losing a decision in that situation. But, like, still, I just think that this kid is so damn good. And outside of losing to Gamrat and Mahachev, he looks like he looks the part. He, he absolutely looks the part. I think that this fight has potential to go sneaky long, though. Like, I, I think everybody's anticipating Sarukian to finish Oliveira, Oliveira to, even, you know, to, to finish Sarukian. I think that if the finish happens, it happens later than what most people are anticipating. So I, I'm going to be picking with, I'm going to be picking Armin Sarukian here at 8,700. And I think it's a combination of striking and wrestling not one or the other. Um, and I think that the blending blending of the styles is what's going to lead Saruki into victory. But like, if you tell me Oliveira knocks him out, I'm doing a victory dance in my living room because I love Charles Oliveira. Well, if you want to go that victory dance, plus 800 to win by TKOKO, plus 400 uh, to win by uh, submission, and plus 750 by decision for the Bronx. On the other side, Sarukim by TKOKO, plus 120, a sub, plus 800, and a decision, plus 320. I would almost kind of be looking at that. If you're looking to play Sarukian in, in a prop, I think I'd probably look at the decision prop at plus 320. Um, you know, one thing that always concerns you about Charles Oliveira is, for whatever reason, he, he always it seems like he needs to get uh, hit a little bit uh, to wake him up in, in the opening round. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like you, you don't want to 
have to get hit. You don't want to have to get hit in order, <laughs> you know, to wake up. So, but, um, you know, I, I really love the matchup. I think it's, it could have been, could have been a main event all day long mm-hmm. anywhere. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be siding with Sarukian. Yeah. I mean, I, it's a slight, uh, slide to me for Sarukian, but, uh, you know, in terms of making GPP lineups, cash lineups, do not mind getting Charles Oliveira. Um, it, it'd be more of from a, you know, thinking of a, a ceiling of 100 points as opposed to saying, you know, Hey, I, I feel pretty confident this fire can go out there and, and get me 55, 60 points potentially, uh, in, in a loss. Uh, but, uh, you know, DeBronx always one of those guys that, yeah, you just love watching him fight. Cause you know that he is going to bring it next up. we got the biggest betting favorite on the card. That is Bo Nickel taking on Cody Brunage. He is a minus 3000 betting favorite, uh, plus 1100 here for Cody Brunage. Brunage is 6,700 on TK. Bo Nickel is 9,500 beat. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of these things of, and I think that Nickel's team has done an incredible job of putting him in the right matchups. And, so smart, man. And not rushing to, you know, get that top 15, top 10 type fight. They're they're taking it slow here. Um, you know, but it and and look, I I've known Cody since he was an amateur, you know, but uh, also I understand that uh yeah, he's in for a long night. Yeah, for sure. And I'll tell you what. You said he's a minus 3000 favorite, Jason? Mhm. Yep. Well, Lock Bo Nickel in, and the reason being is how the hell is he only 9,500 DraftKings? 9,600 against Jamie Pickett, 9,800 against Val Woodburn. I mean, Val stepped up on short notice. I just, I mean, like, we we know what Brundage is. 9,500? Sometimes I avoid the 9,000 option, that 9,500 fighter, but not in this situation. Bo Nickel is giving me no reason to avoid him at all. It's like... I mean, he will go out there and get a first round submission as he did against Jamie Pickett, scored a hundred points, even in that fight where I, nobody was like, eh, that was impressive. It, it kind of wasn't. I mean, you need the guy in the balls a little bit, took him down, then subbed him. Uh, the Val Woodburn combination knocked him out. That was very impressive. Uh, he scored 128. I think that Cody Brundage, we know what he is. He will probably attempt a guillotine here against Bo Nickel. He'll probably be on his back, and then that's all she wrote. And if he doesn't attempt a guillotine, then he's going to get taken down over and over and over, rinse and repeat, as he did against uh, Jacob Malkoon, who was beating the hell out of him. Um, but Nick Maximov went in there and took him, took him all around the ring, gave him a tour of the ring. And I think that Cody Brundage is in for a long night here against Bo Nickel. I think Bo Nickel is going to give him a tour of the octagon. And at 9,500, I love the price tag on him. There are some green tendencies about Bo Nickel and that it's his aggressiveness leaves him open to a point, but he's so aggressive on the feet that it sets up his takedown so well. He can win this fight however the hell he wants. He's a priority play for me, 9,500. Unless Cody lands a Hail Mary, as he might be one of the luckiest fighters out there to to – be in the UFC. I mean, he slammed his way out of a triangle or an arm bar against that kid Reese. Had picked up a DQ win because of the 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 illegal shots Jacob Malkoon was landing, and Malkoon's a monster, but was beating the hell out of him. I th- I think that like, you know, lightning is not going to strike again, and I think that Bo Nickel is going to go out there and decisively win this win this thing. So ninety five hundred, absolute priority play. Let's uh, throw this question in from Chad. I think it's a really good one here from Scary Creations. He goes, Bo most likely will win, but Cody is by far the best fighter Bo has fought. Anyone disagree with that? But now the question becomes, is, do you think Cody Brunch is a better fighter than Jamie Pickett? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, man. I mean, it's it ain't that. Look. I have a good relationship with, with, with Cody Brunch, but the one thing, the, there's one fight that I will never get out of my mind. And even though um, it, it's it, there's these times where you just see a, a lack of, of fight IQ in there with him. Yep. And, and you see it and going out and making bad mistakes here. I mean, and look, to me, this fight, and, and I have no problems if you just sit there and say, you know what, I'm just locking in Bo Nickel. Yep. I'm, I'm going to take it at 9,500. I'm expecting that he's going to probably walk away with a 110, 115. Who knows? Maybe a little bit more. Maybe if you can go out there and get a quick finish bonus. But like to me on the betting side, I'm prop game hunting. And this, and, and to me, I think this is a prop you just play now because I don't think this number is going to get any better as we go out through this week. Bo Nickel wins by TKO KO right now is sitting at plus 130. 
I don't know if you're going to get a better number than that this week. Yeah, it's just really tough to decide what the hell he's going to do, right? Because, like, you know, he throws really heavy hands. Cody's got some quit in him in a little bit when it comes to, like, when the going gets tough, he looks for a way out. Bo Nickel does have really, really, like, slick submission skills. I might like the sub prop a little bit more. And Cody's shown a, a, to be a little inept in that department at times. As a coach, right, it's nice for your guys to go in there and get a quick paycheck. But for a guy that made quick work in his amateur career and a guy that made quick work in his UFC, his Dana White Contender Series career, it's almost, I mean, like in boxing, this is what we've done. In kickboxing, this is what we've done as coaches. We told our we, we tell our guys, I want you to get some rounds in here. I want you to get some rounds in here. And yeah. it's a dangerous game to play. Mm -hmm. Yep. But let's let's show everybody we can go 15 minutes. And if he ever did go 15 minutes, can you imagine? He might like break the takedown, the takedown record, the control time record. It's just like the 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 finish is right there in front of him. It's going to be very difficult for him not to take it. But like one of these days, Nickel's going to get extended, and I think the extension might show his best skills. And I'll base this off a question that came in chat. If we're talking about a one v one situation. Who has the higher ceiling, Bo Nickel at ninety five hundred or Zhang Wali at ninety two hundred? Well, the five rounds makes that a little exactly, bit yeah. of a curveball, but I mean, I'm still gonna go. I can't. I gotta go Zhang Wali in that situation. But like, I love Bo Nickel this week, and there's probably no reason I'm gonna get away from him. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, he, he's to me, this is a showcase opportunity for him. That's why he's the opening fight of the pay-per-view. The UFC knows what they're doing here, and so we'll see how that one goes down. Let's move over to a, a match that we talked a little bit about earlier, Yuri Pahashka and Alexander Rakic. Rakic returning from the ACL entry. He is actually a slight betting favorite in this one, minus 120. Uh, Yuri is at plus 100. He's 8,000 on DK, 8,200 over uh, for Rakic on, on DraftKings. Of course, we all know that this is uh, the, the Pete special of the week, the 8,000, but this this one is, I, I just, I, I think for me, it's more about having the injury questions about Rakic. What does he look like coming off a very notable injury? Yeah. And you know, like some weeks it takes a while for the prep for, for these shows. Like there's so much that goes into, to these shows that Jason and I do, and we appreciate all of you guys. And you know, if you can hit that like button, get us over 150 likes, like that'd be amazing. Get us over a thousand views, a thousand subscribers. That'd be great. But like when the fights are so like the, the fighters in the fights are so talented and we're talking about elite level matchmaking, it's not that difficult. Like, I mean, like I, I know these guys I and you know these guys and like we feel a certain way about these guys and we're really like we can play back their fights in our in our head and then we could go back and we can like, OK, verify our thoughts. Yeah, that, that's correct. But like going and learning somebody who's just debuting into the UFC is completely different. I hold Rakic into championship standards. I really do. I, I love Rakic a lot. The X factor here is coming off that massive knee injury, but I do think that he took adequate time. I mean, we have Rakic, you know, back in May of 2022. So call it two years away. I think that's appropriate, man. I, I mean, like you're going to come in not as a shell of yourself, as the true Alexander Rakic from before. And he's the more cerebral fighter of the two. Yuri's the more weird, awkward, unorthodox fighter with power. Can clearly knock out anybody within the division. Outside the UFC, he was pretty volatile in certain situations where he could get taken down and controlled. But if he could get back to his feet, his crazy explosiveness and his uh, aggressiveness won him a lot of fights. And, and his highlight reel is ridiculous. That right hand is gross. Nasty uppercut, beautiful straight right. Uh, I think that Yuri, as a former champ, this is a buy low spot on him. But I think that, you know, styles make fights. I do think that Alexander Rakic is going to win, Jason. And I think it's because he slows fights down. And if he can, if he's able to slow this fight down against Yuri Prohoshka, I like his chances even more. Um, blending in takedowns, having good top control. That's all like a recipe for beating Yuri Prohoshka. I mean, th this this top control from Alexander Rakic, five minutes against Jan Blachowicz, three minutes against San uh, Santos, 12 minutes against Smith, three minutes against Ozdemir, 12 minutes against Ledet. 
I know Ledette is not nearly the the level, or none of those guys are nearly the level of Yuri Pahashka. But I do think that this being it's a three rounder, right? Yeah, this being yes. a three three round fight. I mean, one takedown around can win you the fight, man. And I, I just think in a five round atmosphere, we could have Yuri Prohashka not getting out of first gear. And next thing you know, the fight's almost over. So give me Alexander Rakic to not necessarily put on a stellar performance, but go out there and win a decision. Yeah, I mean, one of the things when you look at the resumes for both fighters inside the UFC, I mean, Yuri has fought the way better competition. I mean, outside of Anthony Smith, I would sit there and say, what's his next best win? Is it a the 2021 version of Tiago Santos, which was not the Tiago Santos from, you know, a couple years prior to that. I mean, that, that to right. me is, it is the one thing we, we look at a competition and, you know, yeah, we have seen Yuri start off slow. And if you're Rakic, I, I got to imagine the part of the, the coaches there and his team have been saying, okay, let, let's, let's not get into an ego contest here. You know, let, let's not sit there and say, Hey, let's go, let's go, you know, strike for strike with Yuri. Yeah. You go punch for punch with Yuri. You're probably losing that. I mean, like we we did see Alex Pereira just, you know, go out there and outclass Yuri as a technician. And I do view Alexander Rakic as a technician, whereas like Yuri Prohashka is more of a a mystery. He's unorthodox. He's awkward. And awkwardness has led to a lot of his success. Um, But I'm going to slide. I'm going to side with the uh, with the technician here in Alexander Rakic in multiple disciplines. I think he does enough to pick up the win. I don't think he finishes Yuri. I think that he picks up a decision victory. And, of course, uh, not there's not a lot of props out uh, for the rest of these fights, for the rest that we're going to talk here. I would be interested, what is that Rakic wins via decision prop? Yeah. And maybe if I look on the other side, maybe, what is that Yuri wins by stoppage? Maybe maybe if you want to get really crazy, find like maybe a Yuri round three prop, um, you know, but there. But, to, and look, it, it's a key matchup here at, at 205 pounds, and very easily the winner of this fight may very well get the winner uh, of the main event of, of Alex Bahia. And Jamal Hill. Next up, we have got the 145 pound debut of the in the UFC for Al Jermaine Sterling. He takes on Calvin Cater. Uh, Sterling is a minus 170 betting favor. Cater is plus 140. Uh, Sterling 8400 DK and Ka- Calvin Cater 7800. I do know the New England cartel has been out in Vegas for I think about three weeks getting ready for this one. Yeah, I mean, like it's a fantastic matchup, right? Like it's very, very interesting. We have Aljamain Sterling making his featherweight debut against Calvin Cater, who's fought, you know, tremendous competition. I mean, we did just see, and this is actually something I just remembered. Remember this, Jason? Cater is the third fighter on this card to come back from a significant injury. Mm -hmm, You know, like remember what happened in that Arnold Allen fight? That was odd. Um, and I don't remember what his injury was exactly. I don't know if it was MCL, ACL, but it was something to his knee that led to a TKO defeat to Arnold Allen before the fight really even got started. Um, this is a guy in Calvin Cater who's, you know, gone the distance in a five round fight with Josh Emmett, arguably one outlanded him, picked up a unanimous, unanimous decision, five rounds against Giga Chikadze by you know, lacing up those wrestling shoes, came through for us as an underdog, went two of seven in the takedown department with three and a half minutes of control time, you know, went 25 minutes with Max Holloway and got really outclassed, 445 significant strikes to 133. I don't like saying that because I'm a big fan of Calvin Cater and I've, I trained with him once, um, you know, and then went out there and won a five round decision over Dan Ige, you know, picked up a takedown. This guy's boxing is fantastic. I mean, he has a great jab and a beautiful cross. His straight punches are just really, really effective. And I do think that, you know, the type of striker like this can give Aljamain problems in a sense, just because like Aljo gets by by being awkward, very similar to Yuri as from like a very awkward striking, like we'll throw phantom strikes Hands low, odd angles, chopping low kicks. Not a power striker like Yuri Pahashka, but he's very, very odd on the feet and gets you to open up. And when you want to hit him so bad, he changes levels and takes you down. And he has masterful uh, success with his takedowns and his control time. Um, You know, the one fight that you can really go back on and just poke holes in is the Peter Yan performance when they first had that encounter when Yan was taking him down seven times and butchered him on the feet. And as a coach, 
that's the type of fight that you want to uh, you want to emulate. You know, you you want Cater to go out there and and bully Sterling, who's coming up a weight class, and you know, make him feel your power, make him feel your strength, just kind of big brother him. I actually think that Aljamain Sterling just outgrew 135 pounds. I just think that he outgrew 135 pounds. I think that he's a legitimate oh. featherweight. I think that his takedowns are going to come. Um, and whether he gets a takedown or gets back control, I think there's going to be some stalling in this fight. And remember, it's three rounds. Very hard to keep Aljo off you for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, and even if you do, now you got to make up that ground, and they will they will weigh you know damage versus uh, versus control. But I mean, like, I, I do think that Aljo does a pretty good job at controlling you from an advantageous position. So it's not like a stalled out takedown. Um, you know, he, he'll get you down and he'll, he'll take the back with, with a, uh, uh, a body triangle and all that type of stuff. So oddly enough, I think Cater's going to be everybody's underdog of the week and they're going to want to get behind him. I'm still going to pack, uh, I'm, I'm still going to back, uh, you know, Aljamain Sterling here, here at, uh, 8,400. I just think in a 15 minute atmosphere, the wrestling type of strategy favors him significantly. So I'll, I'll pick Sterling to win a decision. You know, one of the things of Calvin Cater's not been taken down since that matchup against the beat Magma Sheripov in 2019, but in all reality, well, who was going to try to take him down? Jeremy right. Stevens, Dan Ige, Max Holloway, Kuchikaze, Kaze, Josh Emmett, Arn Allen. I mean, yes, someone like a Josh Emmett, uh, a Dan Ige could pressure with those takedowns, but primarily he's been going up there uh, against strikers. And, you know, what does Aljo look like? You know, one of the crazy stats about Aljo is when you look at his takedown accuracy in the UFC, he averages 1.97 takedowns per 15 minutes of fighting with an accuracy of only 24%. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't care. He he does not care about like, you know, being inefficient. As a coach, he's definitely not efficient with his energy, but it works for him. And like Calvin Cater stuffed nine takedowns against Dan Ige. I think Ige is a good grappler. I don't think that he's on the the wrestling level of Aljamain Sterling. Um, and then we also saw saw Calvin Cater stuff four takedowns against against Josh Emmett. Very good wrestler wrestler who fell in love with his hands. So I don't necessarily <laughs> say that his wrestling's still on the level of Aljamain Sterling. Like that is Aljo's go-to and like that is his bread and butter. And he'll shoot until the wheels fall off. And I think that's, what's going to happen. He's going to try to stay on him like a leech. And we're going to see Aljamain Sterling either pick up a decision victory, or it's just going to be, it's going to result in a poor score from both of these fighters for DFS. So, um, Give me Aljo here at 8,400. You know, and of course, you know, one of the things about Aljo, he, he's primarily doing a majority of his training camps now out in Las Vegas, does come back uh, to Sarah Longo in terms of that, but does majority of whether uh, he spends a lot of time at the UFC Apex, which that's what a lot of the UFC fighters go out there and do. Um, once once again, prop bets are not out there for this one. I would be more, I would be intrigued in what is that Sterling wins via decision. Um, just with it being a 15-round nature, I can very well see him going out there and getting decision win here. Uh, but Calvin Cater, you know, I haven't seen him since 2020. What, what does he look like coming back from this one? Next up, we have got the UFC debut of Kayla Harrison, as she is a minus 500 betting favorite against Holly Holm. She is plus 350. Home 6900 DK. Kayla Harrison's 9300. And I think the biggest, maybe the biggest storyline heading into the weigh ins on Friday is can Kayla Harrison hit 136? I hope she does. I hope she does. I've been rooting for Kayla Harrison to get over here in the UFC for a while. Um, you know, I've been a big fan. I, I really like her. I, I think that she's shown absolute dominance in the PFL and it's, it's great that she's going to test herself. I don't like the fact that she's now dabbling into 135 pounds as she gets older, but the opportunity opportunity comes knocking 45 pound weight classes doesn't exist for, for women's MMA essentially. So like the biggest fights result in 135 pounds. And, you know, we just saw, um, Norma Dumont make 135 pounds. She's a big, big fighter as well, and she made it. I would imagine that Kayla Harrison has done some test cuts leading up to this uh, this attempt at making 135 pounds against Holly Holm because making this your first time attempting 135 pounds, I, I don't necessarily know if that's the smartest thing. And she's got great people around her, a part of the best camp in the world, an American top team. I would imagine that they have dissected this and been patiently waiting 
to make Kayla Harrison's debut in the octagon. So I, I love it. I, I love the crossover. I think that people, if they don't know who Kayla Harrison is, they're going to be extremely surprised at how dominant she can be. The issue is if she's kept at range, right? Like Holly Holm, if she keeps anybody at range, she can win a decision. Her boxing and her kickboxing is really, really, you know, high level. Uh, she will pitter patter her way into a 15 minute decision. It's only 15 minutes here, Jason. So I, I do think that Holly Holm should do her damnedest to not be touched and grabbed by Kayla Harrison. That's pretty obvious. But I do think that like Kayla is much better at closing the gap than previous opponents. I think the initial, what Rhonda was supposed to do to Holly Holm, I think is what Kayla Harrison's going to do to her. You know, like everybody and their brother was picking Ronda Rousey to go out there and dismantle Holly Holm by taking her down, throwing her on her head, and either subbing her or just making it look very, very quick and easy. And do I think Kayla Harrison makes it quick and easy? I don't know about quick, but I think she's going to look as dominant as ever once she gets her hands on Holly Holm who has actually been a little bit more willing to engage in a grappling, you know, you know, she's, she will attempt takedowns on her own. She'll clinch up a lot. She has a lot of faith in her takedown defense and her takedown offense. Now, um, she probably has the cardio edge, I would say, and, and definitely the resume edge. So as far as a punt and women's MMA tends to go long 6,900 Holly home, I think is going to be very, very popular. I'm not on the Holly Holm side this week. And I mean, I, I think that Kayla Harrison at 9,300 is a discount. Jason, do you happen to know what her betting odds are? Because, um, you know, I, I've already prioritizing Bo Nickel, who's a minus 3,000 favorite at 9,500. And I'm also going to prioritize getting to Kayla Harrison at 9,300 because I, I'm pretty sure we're getting her at a very, very good discount compared to what she was over in the PFL. Yeah, I mean, she was always a massive betting favorite over, over to PFL. I mean, she's minus 500 here. Um, so when when the negotiations started with Harrison's team and the UFC's team, uh, she has come out and said that the UFC made it very clear. It is 135 or bust. We're not going to do yet at 145 pounds. And I remember there was a, a long time ago when I had people in that South Fort M. Mason say, there's no way she can make 136. You know, and that is going to be the big question. Um, I believe she's talked about in the past that she actually did, has already done test weight cuts to get down to it. I mean, and so that to me is going to be the very to my ears. That to me is the very interesting thing as we get into when we get to Friday and, and, and all these fighters step on the scale. That is going to be the very interesting thing. I think I'm sure there's probably going to be some people out there that are probably going to you know find maybe some fight week pictures of Kayla when she was in the PFL and then compare them yeah. to what she's looking like this week. Um, you know, when they do the the press conference on this week, every fighter will be there. So it's going to be very interesting to see here. And, and that to me is uh, you know. And, and like you mentioned, I mean, obviously, if you're Holly Holm, you you gotta stay. You, you gotta keep this thing on the feet because that to me is the always the biggest question mark with Kayla Harrison is what happens if the fight plays out on the feet. Does she have not just the boxing offense but the boxing defense to compete? Even though I mean, Holly Holm is you know at the very back end of her career, is you know, but she's still. I mean, she's she's one of the best boxers out there. One hundred percent, and that's like when you're going up going up against a judoka specialist and a grappling specialist like Kayla Harrison and Ronda Rousey at space, you're going to do well against them. It's just they when they close that space and they get a hold of you, can you handle what's going to happen? I think Holly Holm's going to get thrown. She might even get knocked out from the throw. I, I think she's going to get thrown harder and and, and higher than ever before <laughs> to the moon, bro. I think to the moon, and I'm a big Holly Holm guy. So uh, give me Kayla Harrison here. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I'm interested to see. It, to me, like, the pick is going to be Kayla, but I'm just going to say this. I want to see what she looks like on the scale on Friday. That, if she doesn't look good on the scale on Friday, that could very well change my opinion on, on this one. I don't care what she looks like on the scale. I just want her to hit that number. She hits 136. She could look like Damon Jackson last week, who looked terrible. He looked like, he looked like he starred in The Walking Dead. And then he went out there and did just fine. So she just needs to make the weight. Manon Firo a couple weeks ago looked awful and went out there and had a great performance. But I mean, th this is a totally different situation. But I'm st as long as H Kayla Harrison makes weight, I'm all in. Look, I will not be shocked if Kayla goes out there and has a dominating performance that she gets the next title shot. 
Yeah, I mean. I mean, Julian Payne is not going to like to hear that. But I no. could very easily see, because you know they probably paid Kayla a ton of money to come over. And when you do that, you're being fast-tracked. You are not. And, and look, and she got, you know, I, I think in terms of who was available for her, probably one of the better matchups to get. Is Hey, who? I mean, this is crazy because things change so much. Is Pennington the champ at a 135? Yep, yep. Bad fight for Pennington. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it all comes down to f- five rounds for Kayla is different. I do think that Larissa Pacheco is so damn dangerous. Yeah. Whereas Holly Holm is not as dangerous, but more technical. But Pacheco is like, she's like Amanda Nunes, just like really, really, really big. So I, I think that, you know, the, the wars and the learning from the Pacheco loss, I think did Kayla Harrison some good. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, how many fighters go out there and say this? You more, you learn more from your losses than you ever do in your wins. They, they say you always want those learning lessons and wins, but yep. typically they do not happen there. Next up, we got Sadiq Youssef taking on Diego Lopez. Diego Lopez, a minus 140 betting favorite, plus 120 for Sadiq Youssef. He is 7,700 DK. And for Diego Lopez, PE is 8,500. Y'all know I love my boy Diego Lopez. Oh my God, do I love this kid. This kid is no lie, Jason. I think he's in my, my top. 25 favorite fighters like i love this kid he, he might even be in the top 10 like i just love his jujitsu i love his striking um clearly not a striker you know by nature but he's worked really hard has excellent hands um you know and his power was on full display he's another another fighter that i'm, I'm planting my flag on that's going to be ranked and ranked really high for the next years to come um i i've been all about him wasn't on him for the Evloev fight, but that fight in general just impressed the hell out of me and the entire MMA community. Picking up a first round submission over Tucker and then a first round knockout over Pat Sabatini. I mean, it looked awesome. 105 fantasy points against Sabatini and 90 against Tucker. I think this is a nice, maturing type of fight to see where he's at. He may lose this fight to Sadiq Youssef because Sadiq Youssef is very, very talented. 13 and 3 overall, just lost a decision five rounder against Edson Barboza. I think that uh, Sadiq will level up from that experience. Um, and I actually think that this is going to go the distance. I think one way or another, we're going to see a decision here. I don't think that Sadiq's going to get slept, and I don't think that Sadiq's going to get submitted. And I, I, the same thing, I don't see Diego Lopez getting slept or submitted. And I think that they're going to test each other in all areas of mixed martial arts. And the the issue that I do have with Diego Lopez is if he doesn't find that kill shot on the feet, um, sometimes he plays jujitsu a little too much off of his back. Uh, He's so dangerous and he can sub Sadiq Youssef, no problem at all. He can sub almost anybody in this entire division. But like as a jujitsu practitioner, there needs to be some urgency in an MMA fight because you're on bottom, you're eating shots. It's a little bit different. But I'm still going to lean towards Diego Lopez to win a decision here. If you have a a really strong take on Sadiq winning this fight, I think you know it's smart to target Diego Lopez early before he really gets his feet under him in the UFC. Um, and you know this could be a nice little learning experience for Diego Lopez. But I'm still going to side with Lopez to pick up a victory over Yusef. One way or another, I think this goes 15 minutes. Yeah, you know, when you when you look at Diego Lopez, of course, you know, he came in, you know, took on Evalev. I mean, not, not many people are signing up to, you know, take that fight on, on, on short notice. But to, since then, winning against Kevin Tucker, Pat Sabatini, now here's Sadiq Youssef. I mean, I think this is a, a clear sign that the UFC is, you know, kind of taking a little bit of a faster pace here with Diego Lopez. I think they, they kind of see where they go here. Probably a guy that they're looking to have on that September card in the Spears. This could be kind of that, that typical UFC matchmaking of, you know, Sadiq Youssef guy's been around for a little while. You got the up and coming guy here. Um, I, I do agree with you. I do like Diego Lopez uh, in this spot here. So let's uh, move over to our next one. We got Jalen Turner against Anato Mancano. Jalen Turner minus 235 betting fair plus 190 for uh, Mancano. Mancano 7,300 on DK. Turner is 8,900. And you, you talked about a little bit earlier in the show where Jalen Turner, because of the physique he has at 155 pounds, he can be a, ma- a nightmare matchup here. But also, we, we go back to that Dan Hooker fight where that third round, man, that gas tank was on E. Yeah, it sure was, man. Holy moly. This fight is amazing. I, I love this Jalen Turner, Hanato Moicano fight. I mean, Hanato Moicano has really built himself up 
not into a star, but into a, a higher profile fighter where like, you know, from the interviews to him having his own YouTube channel, he's, he talks really well. And Hanato wants money is awesome. <laughs> like I, I think that Hanato is, is very entertaining and I like him a lot here. Um, you know, solid striker. He actually outstruck, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Calvin Cater back in 2018, Jason. He went out there and put on a clinic. He threw 117 out of 207 strikes, uh, landed 117 out of 207. And in that fight, Cater had an off night, landed only 41 out of 140 significant strikes. And neither one of them had takedowns. So, like, you go back, the skills are there for Hanato Moicano. Um, I just think that he's playing with fire against Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner has that stopping power about him, where on the feet, man, the power, the 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 variety of the striking, the elbows, the knees, the kicks, just the Muay Thai, and then the dangerous submission attacks as well. Like, this is somebody who will butcher you, and then if you have a, a terrible takedown or you're hurt, he'll snatch up your neck and sub you. So like, you know, whereas Drew Dober is very, very one dimensional. Mm -hmm. Drew Dober is very dangerous. And that's why a lot of people were picking him to beat Hanato Moicano. Stylistically though, Drew Dober struggles with anybody who wrestles. Um, and Dober was able to survive in that situation, but Moicano had 10 minutes of control time and went three of six in the takedown department. So almost three minutes per round. Um, I will say that Jalen Turner, in my opinion, the length and the variety of striking, the five inches in reach advantage for Jalen Turner, I think it's going to be a little too much here. I, I do. I think that, you know, Hanato Moicano can stand like Dan Hooker stood and traded with Jalen Turner. Not really, because I think that Dan Hooker for all for, for, you know, his reputation of going out there and not being a, a top notch fighter He's a very good striker who's trained alongside Israel Adesanya for years and years and years. I think, and that was a split decision. I think I think Jalen Turner knocks out Hanato Moicano. But one way or another, I think we need this fight. I think this is pivotal to the slate. 8,900, just under the 9,000 mark for Jalen Turner. 7,300 for Hanato Moicano. I'm just not convinced that Moicano's, like, outside the back take. Say, say like, he does not take Turner's back. I don't think he wins. I think that's his only way of beating him. And Turner got tired at the end of the Dan Hooker fight and had his back taken. So it's totally possible. Uh, but give me Jalen Turner here at 8,900. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned some great points there, particularly there at the end where you're talking about moncano has got to get on the back. And if he can get on the back, that's where – but also, man – you know, it, there's these things in in the fight game that you can never get out of your head, and and that third, you know, it just if Jalen Turner does not get him out in the first or second round, could we see a shift turn in that third round, and and maybe you know, you know, you, you never want to see a draw in MMA, but who, who says? I'm just saying, say Jalen Turner gets up, 2018, and then all of a sudden the third round, gas tank fades, and Nolan McConnell goes out there and gets some damage. Controls the whole third round, and we get three 10 8 rounds. Well, then we got to draw. That shit better not happen now, Jason. You put that out into the, the universe because, <laughs> like, I, I mean, in a five round fight, the likelihood of a draw, in my opinion, is much more increased than a three round fight. But I mean, mm -hmm. it all comes down to a 10 8. But, like, yeah. wonky scoring in five rounds versus wonky scoring in three rounds. But with that way the decision's been going lately, I don't really know. So, um, give me Turner here. I, I like Turner to be a little bit more physical than Hanato Moicano. Next up, we got a female match. We got Jessica Andrade taking on Marina Rodriguez. This is the rare DK spot where it's 8,100 on both sides. Andrade is a minus 125 betting favorite, plus 105 from Marina Rodriguez. And uh, last time out, uh, you know, we, we were kind of fading Jessica Andrade, and boy, she proved us wrong. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, actually, it was a couple fights ago where we where we were getting – you know, away from Jessica Andrade and then like, you know, Mackenzie Dern just is not a good striker at all. And that's where Andrade can go out there and make you pay. And she made, you know, I'm pretty sure I backed her in that situation, but she, she made Mackenzie Dern pay and knocked her out so badly and hurt her on the feet with everything she threw. The issue here is that Jessica Andrade doesn't wrestle as much as she should. Cause if she goes out there and she wrestles Marina Rodriguez, 
I don't really think this fight's all that close. I mean, back in the day, she picked up 10 takedowns back in 2018 over Tisha Torres, uh, two takedowns over Nami Yunus, uh, big explosive slams. If you tell me Andrade wrestles and laces up her wrestling shoes, I think that she can win this fight all day long against Marina Rodriguez. But on the flip side, you have Marina Rodriguez who, you know, has the better, like, she's in better form, even though she is coming off of a second round TKO over Michelle Waterson Gomez. She lost the decision to Jana Roba and got knocked out against Amanda Lemos. The past, like, eight fights, she's looked to be in better form than Jessica Andrade, who looks very volatile at times, just swinging wildly and kind of blitzing forward recklessly. And Andrade literally ran straight into a right hand from Yan Xiaonan, uh, got submitted against Suarez. Uh, we've seen her get knocked out against Shevchenko. You know, like, I, I, I do think that Marina Rodriguez is the play for me because I don't trust the Jessica Andrade wrestling. Um, and she's got short arm attacks, which is like John Lineker. Like she throws hooks and very, very good at throwing her hooks. But I do think that the sniper in this situation, the matador to the bull is Marina Rodriguez. And I think she sticks and moves. And, uh, you know, as long as she keeps it upright, I think it's Marina Rodriguez's fight to lose. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the takedown statistics, uh, you know, it's been since uh, her last four fights, she's not got a takedown. That meaning. Jessica Andrade. Last time uh, she scored a takedown was against Lauren Murphy back in the beginning of 2013. Of course, since she had a three fight losing streak, and um, if if you remember that time, because she just kept taking fight, 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 and people were like, you know, "What are you doing here?" And she's like, "I'm going through a divorce, and I need money." <laughs> and uh, and now, I mean, look, it, but if she goes out there and gets a win here, she puts herself right back uh, in title contention. Which, if I would have told you that six months ago, you've been like, "No goddamn way is that happening." But you know, she's in this position here. But uh, let's move over to our next matchup. We got Bobby Green taking on Jim Miller. Jim Miller, a plus one fifty five betting underdog, minus one eighty five. Bobby Green, Green a six hundred on DK. Miller seventy six hundred. Of course, uh, the storyline with Jim Miller heading this one. He fought on UFC one hundred. He fought on UFC 200, and now he fights on UFC 300. I love Jim Miller. I am rooting for Jim Miller. Um, he's he's the man. He's the absolute man. And, you know, as far as form, Jim Miller's in much better form than Bobby Green. I mean, his last five, 97-point performance submission over Benitez, 126 over Butler, decision loss to Hernandez, 28, Cerrone, 89, Moda, 100. Now, listen to the names from Bobby Green. I think the names from Bobby Green are much higher competition. Jalen Turner, six points. I hated seeing that stoppage. Worst stoppage I've ever seen in my life. Grant Dawson, 128. Tony Ferguson, 108. Gordon, nine because of the headbutt. Dober, 30. And then four against Mahachev. So, clearly the better fighter in form is Jim Miller. Stylistically, though, I do think that this is a very difficult matchup for Jim Miller. I think that he can be kept on the outside and outstruck. Jim Miller is very, very dominant when he's able to take you down. I just think that he's not going to be able to take Bobby Green down with all much success. Bobby Green's ground game and his wrestling is very good. Um, You know, his his jujitsu is not on the same level as Jim Miller. So Miller is live for a submission always. I just don't think he subs Bobby Green. I think the, the higher likelihood is that if, if Miller picks up a victory, he lands a big, big shot, knocks out Bobby Green, who's coming off a knockout defeat to, to Jalen Turner, which was absolutely atrocious. Uh, that was the worst stoppage I've seen in recent memory. Um, but Bobby Green's a veteran, man. I mean, 46, 47 fights to him. Jim Miller, same thing. I mean, 54 fights for him. This is just an epic clash between two veterans. I love it. I think it's going to be a re- very respectful fight. Um, I'm wanting to back Jim Miller, but like I said, I do think that the level of competition is completely different for Miller's last five than mm-hmm. Bobby Green's last five. So Bobby Green's actually a sneaky, sneaky fighter this week. Cause I do think that could he, could he finish Jim Miller? Yeah. But I also think that he could put up some sneaky volume if this turns into an absolute war. I mean, back in 2022, he put up 105, uh, 105 fantasy points over Nasrat Hakparast by landing 188 significant strikes. No takedowns, no control time, no nothing. So 
100 points is definitely in the realm of possibility for, for both of these fighters, but I'm going to be picking Bobby Green to win via decision. Could very well be a leverage play of the week. When you think yeah. about, you know, all the other fighters that people are going to be getting to in their contest, you know, those high end 9,000 options we're talking about, you know, Wei Li and, and Bo Nickel. You, you mentioned someone like uh, Jalen Turner. I mean, th- those, it, you, you could find yourself being a leverage play for Bobby Green. And of course, Jim Miller is going to have to deal with the trash talking because you know that's what Bobby Green does. I can't. I love it, though. I love Bobby Green. I really love Jim Miller, though. Like, I love Jim. I, I, I think I, that Jim is just a stud. And he's such a nice guy, too. Like, I don't know if you've ever dealt with him before, but, like, I feel like Jim is just a stand-up guy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've I've not I've uh, dealt with Bobby Green in the past, not with Jim Miller, but I think one of the points that you bring up is really looking at the who Jim Miller has been fighting mm-hmm. over the past couple of years, and when then you look at what Bobby Green has been fighting. Bobby Green's been constantly fighting the top ten, top fifteen in this division. Where you look at, I mean, just going back to twenty twenty one. Joe Selecki, Eric Gonzalez, Nicholas Moda, Donald Cerrone, Alex Hernandez, Jesse Butler, Gabriel Benitez. Now, the Jesse Butler situation, that was a, a fight week change, you know, where he had a change in opponent here. But, you know, it's just it's a it's a different level of competition here. Um, and, uh, you know, Jim Miller is one of those guys that the wheels just don't fall off. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember years back, like when Roosevelt Roberts was the hotness and was breaking onto the stage and was going up there against Jim Miller and. I was like, man, and Jim Miller's shown to deteriorate over time and like look to, to, to look for a way out at times. And I thought Roberts was going to do well. And man, Jim Miller just go out there and he was taking, taking out these prospects and then he's had short notice replacements. The thing here is that I do think Bobby Green would have done the same thing to all those fighters Jim Miller fought, yeah. if not worse. Then our opening matchup of the night will be at Bantamweight. We got the former champion Cody Garbrandt taking on the former flyweight champion Davidson Figueredo. Figueredo is a minus three hundred betting favorite, plus two forty for Cody Garbrandt. Figueredo is ninety one hundred DK, and Cody Garbrandt is seventy one hundred. And Pete, one of the more interesting tale of the tape on this one is the fact that Davidson Figueredo has a three inch reach advantage against Cody Garbrandt. Yeah, it goes to show you, man, that sometimes people just belong in a weight class up. Like, I think Aljo grew out of his weight class, and I do think that the same thing can be said for Davis and Figueredo, who just, you know, you can be completely dominant at 125 pounds, but, you know, as you get older, it becomes more difficult to cut, and you also start to take some away from your performance. And maybe some of Figueredo's lackluster performances were due to the, the harsh weight cut and the, the drastic body transformation he's had. I don't know, but I do think that timing's everything here. And Cody Garbrandt, you know, picking up back-to-back wins over Trevin Jones and Brian Kelleher, good for him. I mean, I mean, like, I was rooting for Cody to get back on, you know, the winning ways and get back on track a little bit because it was pretty sad. It's pretty sad to see a former champ and just somebody that, you know, was elite at one time fall so hard and uh you know picked up a very very lackluster win over trevin jones decision victory jason landed 26 significant strikes in two takedowns i mean in round one against brian kelleher landed 20 significant strikes and knocked him out um and that was in three minutes and 42 seconds if you look at davidson figueredo his volume is a little on the low side as well and usually flyweights and bantamweights do not have low volume. So it, it's pretty interesting to me because you see Figueredo with 45 significant strikes and four takedowns against Rob Font. You know, that's his debut at uh, at 135 pounds. You know, even in a three-round bout, you know, in the third round against Brandon Moreno in their title fight, he threw 19 significant strikes and it went to the third round. So like, I, I do think that these guys could somewhat have a staring contest. And if you look at their metrics, three strikes, 3.08 significant strikes landed per minute for Figueredo, 3.06 for Cody Garbrandt. Um, you know, the strikes absorbed 3.91 for Garbrandt and 3.46 for Figueredo. I think that the grappling is going to be nullified. The submission skills of Figueredo are always live. He has a fantastic guillotine, but. All the years of Cody Garbrandt training at Team Alpha Male, I do not think he's going to get caught in a guillotine. I think, I honestly think what's going to happen is I'm going to avoid this fight for a little bit. Cody Garbrandt mm-hmm. can clearly win. He can knock out Figueredo. He can pick up a decision. 
but I think Garbrandt's going to be doing well until all of a sudden he he's not. And I think like, you know, round one could pass maybe even midway of round two. And then all of a sudden Figueredo just lands a shot and it's over. And I think that's really what's going to happen because, uh, there's a lot of red flags on Cody Garbrandt, even though he's in, in solid form on back-to-back victories mm-hmm. um, and less red flags about Figueredo. So give me Figueredo win by knockout. I think it comes late though at round two or round three. Yeah. I mean, you, you think where Cody Garbrandt was back in 2016 and, and you know, becomes a champion and you're thinking about how high the ceiling could be and Damn. just, you know, then, then the knockout to TJ Dillashaw and, and that to me is always going to be the concern if, if of if he gets into a firefight, um, right? Is that chin going to hold up? I mean, that that's that's that is my concern. And that's the fight IQ, right? Like, he, I mean, like he may be very cerebral in the training room, but it, it's it reminds me of somebody who just kind of loses their cool a little bit, and they just want to get it back asap, and they get hurt, and they got to get it back, and then it turns into an emotional mess, and you know, Pedro Munoz and you know, TJ Dillashaw and all these other fights. And he's just like, Oh my God, he's getting slept in Kai Kara France. And I just think that, you know, it all points to Figueredo eventually landing that shot that knocks him out. Let's get into our straight up fight picks before we get into some listener questions, wrap this episode of the podcast, uh, the main event, uh, give me and still Alex Bahia. Oh, stop it. I'm going Jamal Hill. Uh, I'll take Whaley. I go in Whaley. You guys know how I feel about Yan Shanan, though. I will say this: like I think this fight's closer than what the DraftKings lines are on this one, but I think Gaethje gets the job done. Give me Max Holloway, hater. Uh, I'm gonna go underdog number one for me in Du Bronx. <laughs> okay, I'm going Armin Saruki, and I don't hate that underdog at all. Uh, obviously, Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel. Give me underdog number two, Yuri Prohaska. All right, I'm going Alexander Rakic. Uh, give me Aljo. Aljo. Harrison. Harrison. Diego Lopez. Lopez. Turner. Turner. Andraj. Ooh, I'm going Marina Rodriguez. Uh, Green. Yeah, yeah, Bobby Green. And then Figueredo. Uh, get some questions Figueredo. in from this, uh, in from Discord. Of course, uh, totally free to join. Great conversation going on in that community already going on this week. Uh, first off, we got value plays under 8K and a core three on DraftKings. Boy, I, I think there is a ton of value under 8K this week. Oh, yeah. I mean, like a ton of talent. So, I mean. Top three fights. Yeah. That's why, like, for construction, like, Man, I want to pick. You know what? I almost just want to pick Yan Shaonan just just for just just because no logic. Get, give me Yan Shaonan. I'm switching it. So I got two underdogs. I got I got Jamal Hill, Yan Shaonan, uh, and then Max Holloway. So those are my three underdogs. I mean, look, I I think when you talk about going with a core over on DraftKings, it, to me, I think it it will for me it starts with Bo Nickel. Okay, so I just pulled up DraftKings right, and just put in a sample lineup here. Bo Nickel, okay, at that point, now my average remaining per player is 8,100. So, you know, I got to kind of go down here to the bottom. So, like, if I was going to go with a second core play, I think even though I like Gaethje to win, I think it's going 25 minutes, I would make Max Holloway my second core play. Oh, yeah, same here. I mean, so that that helps out a little bit here. And then if I'm looking for, you know, obviously trying to, to, you know, I would love to get to Wei Lee, but if I do that, having her and Nickel in a lineup, I, it really kind of could kill you. But I do understand why you would get there. Um, you know, maybe maybe a Jalen Turner, eighty nine hundred. I mean, if if you go with a core of Wei Lee, Bo Nickel, Max Holloway, that leaves you with uh, seventy nine hundred remaining per player. It's not bad. It's not bad when you see the names under eight thousand. Like, oh no, I got a, I got a roster, Charles Oliveira, and who else? Let me let me look, let me look at this list. I got a roster, Charles Oliveira, uh, Jamal Hill, Calvin Cater, Hanato Moicano, Holly Holm, Sadiq Youssef, Jim Miller. I mean, goodness gracious! I mean, the options are just endless. So, it's uh, it's it's a crazy week, and I'm here for it. I'll give you a, just a sample lineup I just put together. Let me hear it. Bo Nickel, Max Holloway, Zhang Wali, Charles Oliver, Jamal Hill, and then last fighter in, it was a choice of do you go Diego Lopez or Aljo. I went Lopez. I like it. It's not a bad lineup at all. It, yeah. It's 
it's this is a week where the the talent is out there to leave whatever the hell you want salary wise on the table but i'm gonna spend as much as i can because i do love these nine thousand options so like yeah. i want to get to them but like as far as underdogs in the mid-range it's okay to just have a ton of salary left over because like i said the, the strength of schedule for some of these underdogs is crazy yeah, I mean, and I think when you look at the value, I think you, you look at, you know, uh, cash games. Jan Janan would be more of a cash game play me than, than yeah. a, in a GPP. Uh, Holloway, I would play in either GPP or cash just because of their, um, you know, other ones. I mean, to me, uh, Charles Oliveira, GPP at 7,500. Um, and not to Mancano, potentially a, a round three type where Jalen Turner, maybe that, that gas tank is where down is able to get on the back. I think that that's another one that I would put out there in terms of some values underneath uh, 8,000 there. Uh, best leverage play. I would tell you, I mean, obviously we don't know what ownership is, but I'm kind of thinking that you, you might be looking at someone like a Bobby Green that may be the leverage play this week. Yeah, that's a great call. And I, I do think like when you kind of think about this fight getting extended, and the volume of Bobby Green, he can put up that hundred points as as we've seen it in the past. And you know, I, I do think that's probably the best call out there as far as leverage. Uh, take down upside. I mean, we we've mentioned about Wei Li, we've mentioned about Sarukian. Um, yeah, I thought you brought up a really great point about Bo Nickel. If that ATT team says, "Hey, let's try to get some work in and, and get some cage time in there," I mean, if he goes in with a mindset, I'm trying to get some cage time. I mean, he could rack up a ton of takedowns. I think it's going to happen one of these days because as a coach you need to know your i mean like in a training room is one thing but you also want your guy to go out there and experience a little adversity and like it's it's a dangerous game we play but it's it's part of the maturing content uh process like yeah. he needs to go out there and just like oh shoot okay like this is different from wrestling i know he's in shape and he can go i just don't want him getting quick paychecks you know every single time because say he fights hamza shemaev or something like that Totally winnable fight for him, but he's never. We've never seen him in those types of situations, and it's just probably better off doing it against a low level opponent than a high level opponent. Yeah. Uh, next up, rank the nine K options. So we got Whaley at ninety two hundred, Nickel ninety five hundred, Harrison ninety three hundred, Figueroa ninety one hundred. Uh, for me, uh, I will go Nickel, Whaley, Kayla, Figueroa. I have it the same way. I think Figueroa is the worst one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think your top three are, are very clear uh, in terms of that. Uh, best punt play? Um, I think the safest punt play is Max Holloway. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, play, and I don't like Cody. I don't like Holly Holm. Maybe a punt Cody Garbrandt if he's kind of like finally has some confidence about him. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll let other people do that, not me. Uh, favorite core plays. We already kind of talked about that. Favorite inside the distance fighters. Uh, I look at the main event. Um, I look at the, I look at Bo Nickel. Yep. Kayla Harrison. Um, those would be my top ones. Did you say Turner and Moicano? I did not know. Yeah. I That's like that one out. from an inside the yeah. distance, inside the distance. But besides that, I think we're going to see some, some, uh, extended fights. Uh, live dogs, uh, Jamal Hill at plus 110 uh, yep. would, would be a someone up there. Um, if I was going to live with probably number. like Cater. I'm not in, uh, I'm not there this week, but I don't um, if Rockish doesn't go the takedown route, uh, Yuri at plus 100, I think is another live dog. Yeah. Yeah. Totally fair. Uh, <laughs> all right. Sam's number here on over under. How many fights we got? 13? 13. He puts a number of 11 and a half. Sam. <laughs> Sam, you're the you're the only reason I came back to do this show because if these were real numbers that you're putting out there, I'd be a millionaire because it's less. <laughs> yes. It's less. 11 and a half. Yeah, well, the number is way well, what two fights does he think goes the distance? I mean, at that point, which ones? I don't even know. Uh, there's there's certain fights I think have got a good probability to go 25 minutes. 11 and a half, my man? 
I mean, like, look, I could see, I could see Figueroa Garbrandt, Green Miller, Andrade Rodriguez. Yep. Cater Sterling, Yuri Rakic, yeah. Oliveira Sarukian, Gaethje Holloway. I think those are seven fights that I would say I think have a a good chance to potentially go all 15 minutes or 25 minutes. Totally agree. And we could be dead wrong, but 11 yeah. and a half is absurd. Yeah, that, that's, that's a massive number. I appreciate there. the love, Sam. But Yeah, we appreciate that, that super chat that you had earlier oh, yes. here. Um, no one's saying Armin for leverage. That's that's a, another potentially good leverage play there. I'm interested to see where that ownership comes out because the popularity will skew. So if somebody's really popular, Charles Oliveira is super popular. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to have heavy, heavy ownership. But I, I also think that a lot of people do respect Sarukian too. He's not an unknown. I mean, if you're a part of the MMA game, you know he's damn good. Yeah, yeah. This is not like some new kid on the block. Like I feel like, say, different weight classes, I think. But say Movzar Evloev was here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, different weight classes. I don't think that there would be as much respect for Evloev as there is Sarukian, right? I mean, like he's somewhat of an unknown. People are like, eh, not really sold on him. We've seen a lot of Sarukian, especially from the COVID times to now. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I, it could be based on, on the numbers, but I don't think it should be a leverage play. Yeah, no, I mean, it'll be, I mean, look, I would expect that the ownership for Oliver and Holloway will be probably, I would say maybe outside of Hill would probably be the underdogs that are going to have the most ownership this week. That'd be, that'd be my perception of the situation. What's your highest owned fighter this week? What do you think? And how much are they coming at? Cash games, it, cash games would definitely be Bo Nickel. Okay. GPP? I think I'd probably go Whaley. And what do you think she's at? 30, 40? I, I would think around 40%. Damn. That's a lot. But I think it's deserved. Because look what she just did, right? Like, she just put up. 191 fantasy points by doing whatever the hell she wanted to against Amanda Lamosh. Um, the, yeah. the, the sky's the limit with her with her fantasy score. And Matt just put it in the chat. He says, damn, $30 for the DK main buy. And I saw that I saw that a second ago. Yeah, 30, 30 bucks. You wouldn't get in that big one. But what's I the like thing? It, it's man. 200K? 200K, what was it? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with it. Keep growing. Keep growing. And, you know, this is... This fight card, the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, I can I can get enthused about this. And you guys can clearly tell. I, I'm excited to talk about these fights. Um it, it's just it's a it's a lot. It's a lot the, between Jason's schedule, my schedule, and and then trying to just balance everything going on in life to get up here and talk about some fights that should not be in the UFC. It, and then like when you don't get them right, you feel you feel bad. And I want to win a ton of money, and I know our listeners want to win a ton of money, but it's like, dude, I'm going off of what we know. You know what I mean? And it's just like it's a pre- unpredictable sport as it is. It doesn't need to be that unpredictable. You might as well go to a regional MMA show. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're talking about uh, we do not have a UFC card next week, by the way. Our next UFC okay. card will be April 27th, uh, where, of course, uh, that that fight card just went through a change. as no cop pulled out. Alex Perez now stepping in and taking on Matthias Nicolau. Ew. Yes, that is your main event. Ew, that's the main event. That's what I'm saying. Shit like that. So, like, pay-per-views are going to get me really excited. I mean, we'll, we'll see how this is, but, like, I hope 300 delivers. Yeah, uh, I will say this. We'll, we'll try to put some stuff in Discord uh, later on this week. We do have a PFL show on Friday night. That's also in Las Vegas. That's light heavyweights and lightweights there. I was looking at some of the odds that are up there. There was one odds I mentioned that I saw. There's not many PFL odds out there. Usually they you won't get them until about two, 48 hours before. Uh, but the one that sticks out to me, is Adam Piccolotti is a plus one thirty six betting underdog against JJ Wilson? That's an underdog. I think you. I would be looking to uh, to target over there. I was my my call of Vassell was looking really good for about four minutes and forty seconds, and then he got reversed, and then there was no gas tank. Yeah, yep. I was it's sitting watching the fight. I'm like, I'm feeling really good. I had the I had a little coin on Vassell, and then I was like, oh crap. Yeah. 
<laughs> the wheels <laughs> fell off really quickly. <laughs> when he got to about 20 seconds in the second round, I go, well, lost this bet. Yep. Well, you already start looking at what's next. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's over there. Um, Brent premise has a, as a minus one fifty five. um, favorite is another one i was to be looking out there uh but uh you know some ish, i will say this some interesting matchmaking the way they're doing this i'm like surprised yeah. the fact of they're doing clay collar patricky pitbull you know at the first stage of this lightweight tournament because i think that literally could have been uh, a potential final um mads are Sab- sablu c now up at 205 pounds this guy initially started at 70 then went to 85 now he's at 205 pounds what the hell Taking on Joshua Silverio. What the hell? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'm looking at Rob Wilkinson at minus 185 over Tom Breeze, and Tom Breeze is kind of that prospect we always heard about, and he just never really materialized into no. what the reputation from what we heard. So I think that Rob Wilkinson's given me no reason to not like him at one at minus 185, and. Yeah, Sadabu doing the whole three weight class thing. It's what happens when we get older, right? And he's still favored over Josh Silveria. So, uh, I mean, he's a big guy and his range and length is a problem for people. So, I, I don't necessarily uh, think it's a wrong thing. Hey, I'm getting older. I'm trying to drop weight, bro. Yeah. In <laughs> fighting, it goes the opposite. And, like, you don't want to so. be, you know, like Frankie Edgar dropping 135 pounds at the end of your career. That makes no sense. Unfortunately, we see it happen all the time, you know, yeah. you know, um, and I think a lot of it, I mean, look, especially at the UFC level, it's a lot of it's about money, you know, and, and trying to cash in on those last couple of paydays you potentially have here. So, uh, but as always, we appreciate everyone tuning in. Of course, uh, if you're checking us out after the fact, if you can leave a comment in YouTube, that's uh, great. We appreciate that. That'll, that'll help the algorithm out there. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. Of course, uh, we'll have a DraftKings contest later on this week. Of course, uh, the score totally free. Uh, Pete, anything else you want to mention before we get out of here? No, I just want to say thanks, guys. Thanks for the support. Um, you know, it's been a journey here with Jason, and you know, uh, it, it'd be nice for us to to really start to, you know, get those followers past a thousand, and it'll help us out tremendously, uh, subscribers rather. Um, and it'd be nice because trust me, Jason and I don't want to go nowhere. Uh, it, it was it was me taking a break last week, and uh, you know, it, it does feel nice to be back talking fights with a good quality card. So uh, let's hit those, hit those, uh, the, the like button, get us over 150 likes, help us get to a thousand subscribers. If you guys have friends that are into MMA, recommend the channel to them if you can. And uh, yeah, let, let's win some money this week. And of course, uh, that does it for this episode of the Fight HQ podcast. Of course, you got any questions that uh, you can hit in the YouTube chat, also on Discord as well. So we will talk to you on the next episode of the Fight HQ podcast.